not certain where. Well, all right. Hello. All right. I am Tom. I'm Johanan. Everyone I'm, else there? Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm Max Kobe from the Escaping Atheism Project. I'm John Bat Baptiste. All right. Thank you guys for coming on board. Uh, sadly, uh, Deflane Atheism couldn't make it this week, but we'll see if we can schedule him in our time. But for now, we have two new guests, John and Escaping Atheism Max. Glad to have you aboard. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, John? Um, I'm a nobody. I help Max on the Escaping A Atheism Project um, from time to time. And yep. Well, you're somebody now. Just being on here is a really big help. <laughs> and you're an Orthodox Christian. He's an Orthodox Christian. He's a real smart guy. Kind of tired. That's great. Kind of good guy. We need as Still many. Tired, yeah. We need as many smart guys on here as we can. Yeah. And uh, you, uh, Max, from Escaping Atheism, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself before we start? Oh, I suppose. I run the Escaping Atheism Project. I am a uh, 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 former atheist. I was an atheist for a really long time, and a pretty serious-minded one. Um, I had grown up in a sort of fundamentalist Christian Calvinist background and rejected that, and uh, became agnostic, and then kind of atheist, and then uh, very atheist, and then kind of became a philosophical theist, and eventually join the church. So uh, that's me. And then as an ex-atheist, uh, I, I left atheism about 10 years ago, and I kind of assumed it would die down as a fad. And now what I see is that it's a very malevolent cultural force for my kids. I'm concerned for my family just because, um, you know, the anti-religious zealotry has gotten so great, and the emptiness of, of atheist arguments is so most atheist arguments are so vacuous, um, that's where the project was began. We don't do Christian apologetics, at least not directly, you know, except incidentally to answer questions, although most of us are Christians on the project, we aren't all, and uh, that's who we are. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is very interesting. So, we have an ex-atheist on here. That's great. Oh, yeah. I was a serious one, too. Real serious. Interesting. So, when you were an atheist, uh, what was that like exactly? Could you give us a little detail about that? What was it like? Well, I think it was more or less Penn Jillette, maybe Christopher Hitchens and a few others who talked me into embracing the label and the philosophy. Um, I, I, I had had a very bad negative upbringing, including negative experiences with religion and people um, throwing Jesus at me and, and harassing me and threatening me and all that sort of thing with hellfire and all that sort of thing. I rejected it all. I got seriously into science, um, uh, science, science fiction, all that stuff. Uh, read most of the big name atheists and, uh, you know, I decided it didn't make sense. You should take it seriously. Richard Dawkins made the case that you should take it seriously. And I said, yeah, I, you know, he's probably right. If you're going to take this, embrace this and learn what you can through science naturalism. Eventually, I couldn't sustain it anymore. And also, the behavior of my fellow atheists and the, the, the blatantly false things I would see them saying or doing, and I would even catch them out on BS they would spout in science, and that's kind of what caused me to leave. That and just general poor behavior. Because um, uh, uh, atheists tend to get very abusive to people who about the part, who, who, who deviate from their party line. They deny having a party line, but they got one. Um, this is not necessarily true for the average, I don't know, 19-year-old who knows nothing about religion kind of person, but at some point, especially when you get past a certain age or so, you've had opportunities to look into answers for your questions and you haven't tried. There's something problematic there. Uh, Atheism makes no sense, and the more I have examined it in, in the years since I abandoned it, the more obvious that becomes. I don't see how anybody intellectually honest... Atheism is a big ball of nothing, and as a cultural phenomenon, it's very negative, and that's what I see. 
And that's the reason why you left it. You found they were spewing out anti-science and... Oh, well, they were anti-science. They were very obviously anti-science. They were claim, and it's still true. They will claim to be the pro-science people, but uh, they only accept any science that happens to match what they already want to think, for the most part. And this is first-hand experience from being around them? Oh, yeah, from extensive experience of being an atheist, um, hanging with other atheists, and also the strange experience of being an ex-atheist and hanging with atheists and just not talking religion. And you hear some stuff out of people who are ideological atheists. It's it's astounding the the, the utter contempt they hold that the, they tend to hold for anybody who's a believer is uh, is often staggering. And what's also staggering, like I was looking at this article that you wanted us to look at, idealists do not understand quantum mechanics. I am not a I am not into quantum mechanics. I mean I'm not an expert. Uh, I know more than most people. Um, but it doesn't matter because just many of the statements in this article you can debunk just right. by asking some Let's of those focus on this though to like actually debunk them because they need to be called out every time they do this like when they they, they, they they're going to use this kind of Sophistic arguing to try and get away with their stuff if we don't blow them out of the water each time, you know I uh, Yes Absolutely we here we have Johan and this is one of Johan's requests to do this blog page of Antithesis and X, who I actually know through discussions on Facebook. Hey, Johan, where do we find you? I'm sorry to interrupt. Where do we find your, your YouTube? This Johan and Rots. Johan and Rots? Okay, we'll look for you. That's right. Last video we made a response to Messianic Manic, and I was actually very shocked that he didn't make another response to that. Usually he keeps going on until he has the last word. Uh, but this is this was between Deflane Atheism and Johan and I, but... Uh, you guys are new to this podcast right now. I felt that we need to stretch out our, you know, wings to go to other atheists, and we just chose Antisys and X next. And this page, this blog, I also read about. It's just full of just contradictory, made-up shit. It's just terrible. It's I, I don't understand how anyone could read this and think this guy was even smart. I, I'm surprised he even has a fandom. To, to me, he's the Antisys and X is like the Cam Ham of atheism. That that's. Sweet. Anyways, uh, this is just uh, so for right now. We are just going to review this right now. Okay, does did everyone pull up uh, their own personal blog post on your own computers? Yeah, uh -oh. I'm looking at it now. Idealists do not understand quantum mechanics. Don't let, right. let me dominate the conversation. But I'll, I mean, right from the opening paragraphs, there's problems with what he's saying. So I don't know who wants to go Let's to. Let's look at number one. Okay, let's just the start. Heart, yeah, let's just jump into the points here. All yeah. right, the heart and soul of all quantum mechanics is the Schrodinger equation. Correct. Real quantum mechanics is accomplishing modeling some potential function into the Schrodinger equation, applying boundary conditions, and then solving for the corresponding eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. Also correct. All right, you stick your energy value into the Schrodinger equation, solve, and then you can plug in different um, operators to find momentum and position and so on. Everything we know about the nature of the subatomic particles is more or less expressible within this framework. Yep. No. Well. Basically correct. That no, actually, well, actually is correct. I mean, there is. Yeah, that's correct. Everything we know is is the operant word there. I mean. Yeah. Well, let's, 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 I mean, from what I know of quantum, because I was taught quantum mechanics in school, and sure. it's never been wrong once, right? Right. It's actually the most tested theory in all of science, and so yeah, that's a reasonable thing thing to say. Right. Yet quantum idealists make absolutely no effort to express their ideas in the same way. It's because we're working at a conceptual level. See, this is... Okay, hold on here. Let's finish this thought here. Quantum mechanics, therefore, cannot possibly support idealism because idealists are simply not doing quantum mechanics in any meaningful mathematical capacity. That's yeah, a non sequitur. That's a non sequitur. Just because... What's the mathematical formula to prove that... I... He's, he's one of the equations. That's simply not true. I mean, yes, our, our videos... See... The Schrodinger equation is tough stuff. You have it's differential calculus and so on, right? You don't do that. You, you when have you ever seen Michio Kaku or Brian Greene or any of those people on television talking in detail about the Schrodinger equation? They may talk about it in passing, but they're going to talk about the conceptual level of quantum mechanics because you're you're talking to a lay audience, right? Right. So by that standard, I mean they're not doing it either because they're not talking about those things. I mean that's what they're doing in their office, you know, when they're they're not presenting to the public, but or when they you know teach to a, a class or something. But you're not dealing with 
steps. You're not you're not teaching. Of course, we're not doing. I mean, I brought up the Schrodinger equation. I think in one or two of my videos, right, in some mathematical level. But of course, I'm not using the Schrodinger equation in my videos because I'm talking to a lay audience. Okay, I, I don't have time to be teaching people differential equations and and probability theory and all that stuff. You know. Well, and plus, how would you prove idealism or realism or materialism using equations using the Schrodinger equation? Well, you can. Well, that's well, see. Here's the irony in all this. And? You can do exactly that. I mean, you saw. Um, we are referring to things that come from the Schrodinger equation, uh, the Bell uh, inequality, and specifically the Leggett inequality, which was used to f violations that proved that realism is false. Right? Mm -hmm. um, those things come from the Schrodinger equation. So, firstly, this is a non sequitur. Okay, just because idealists, right, who are not 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 the theory of idealism, but idealists are not you know using quantum mechanics in the Schrodinger equation sense. You know, in the context of these videos, you know, not whatever else we're doing, doesn't mean that, you know, therefore quantum mechanics does not support idealism or cannot possibly support idealism. Yeah, well, that's I, I, I have, go ahead. Because, because we actually do reference things that derive from the Schrodinger equation. And we do it all the time. It's just that, you know, we don't go into the details of how the math is derived because, you know, you, you give a, a mathematical proof of Leggett's inequality to the audience, they're, they're not going to be interested. The audience isn't going to be interested in that. Now, I, would also note, I would also note that, that many sources, like I know Inspired Philosophy has done, Inspiring Philosophy has done it, I, I'm pretty sure you have too, is uh, um, uh, certainly others have copious references to the peer-reviewed data, which you can go to see. Oh, yeah, exactly. I, I've done all that all over the place. And then so the, the, the evidence is there. The equations are there. Uh -huh. The two papers you can go get. Exactly. I've done that numerous times. And now what's funny about this is uh, I call him my apprentice. It's kind of a, a joke. He's uh, Dario Scotto, who is he's an atheist who got converted via the quantum idealism approach. He now he's actually converted by the digital physics argument before IP even made a video on it. Like that was the first guy I got with it. Mm -hmm. um, he has specialized it now, and he's actually take, like making a, a mathematically precise version of it. And it uses the density matrix that you get from the wave function of the universe, which is derivable from the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, which is a version of the Schrodinger equation. And he then uses that density matrix to calculate the, or set up an equation to calculate the phi or integrated information content of the universal wave function. So you yeah, very directly there. He goes from Schrodinger equation to using the Schrodinger equation to calculate the density matrix to using the density matrix to calculate the integrated information content of the universe or the conscious state of the universe this, the universe is being simulated in so that's that's very directly false I mean yes we, we're not doing that in our videos because our videos are not supposed to be there to you know go into the mathematical nitty-gritty detail but we're talking about the the basic you know conceptual ideas involved which happen to be also modeled with the Schrodinger equation Hey, Jean, I think we keep hearing you inhale on something there. You might uh, it's my to... fan in the back. It's really hot. It's Southern California, so. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, not to... I'm really uh, turn it off. Yeah, just... Is uh, it better now? No, no, just uh, not to interrupt, but uh, uh, I think uh, if we start with this uh, this uh, this page right here, uh, I think we should start with the beginning and read the bottom so the viewers don't get confused or we read things out of context. Like, uh, I was a little lost what you were saying here, so can you we, were, like... He was just talking about number one says the heart he's going straight oh. to the bullet points number one the heart and soul of all quantum mechanics is the Schrodinger quality all right then true blah 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 I would also point out there's a little weasel wording in here since there's things we can't tell tell that scientists can't say about subatomic particles um, but whatever I guess that's just a quibble, but it seems question begging it gives you the idea that they're could be nothing else to know, and the biggest question of all is why is the stuff why are, why are the quantum functions doing that at all? Why do they operate that way, and why do they keep operating that way? That's a question I have, and again, it's one you can't answer. I don't think. I mean, we have answers in the math for some things, but we can't say ultimately why are they there and why are they acting that way. Um, can I skip to number two? Yeah, you yeah. could go on to number two. Yeah, we already so, did number one, so we yeah. so far as number one. Firstly, it doesn't follow that because 
ideals are not in the context of, you know, popular level videos using the Schrodinger equation does not mean quantum mechanics does not support idealism. Secondly, yes, we do use the Schrodinger equation to argue for idealism, either through, you know, inequalities that prove non-realism or through basic conceptual ideas of quantum mechanics that follow from the Schrodinger equation or through, you know, the, the fancy thing Dario was doing with calculating the density matrix or the, the, the integrated information saved from the density matrix that is given, you know, that follows from the Schrodinger equation. Or the wave function I, of the... Okay, so number two, I'll read it and let's hear someone comment on it. Quantum mechanics is philosophically antithetical to the entire idealist sense of epistemology. That's a broken sentence. That's, that's yeah, this... And what's, uh, uh, what do you mean? Yeah, well, well, um, I, you don't even have to know quantum mechanics to know... Um, that Schrodinger and Heisenberg were not materialists. I don't know that they would have declared themselves idealists, but they were certainly not atheists, and they were certainly not materialists. And so they would have to be either some kind of realist or idealist or just confused. And I would even bet on confused myself. But, I mean, it's totally false. Even Einstein at the end surrendered on realism. And all the big gut names in in, in Quant QM were not atheist. Um, so there. Now maybe Johan's got some more technical things to say. You know, that's the funny thing is it's you know it's it's uh, Max Planck actually deduced. He actually has a quote saying that his research into quantum mechanics is what led him to idealism. And that's Planck. I mean, it's the guy. I feel like we're crying out loud. And he's not, he, I mean, that's a very direct quote. I mean, the other ones, they may not say idealism outright, but they say things that are pretty close, you know, like Wolfgang Pauli referring to quantum mechanics as um, lucid platonic mysticism, uh, Heisenberg saying everything that uh, there, um, matter doesn't exist, it's all the, the debate between Democrates and, and Plato is definitely, definitively no. decided in terms of Plato. Not a single name in, in quantum physics that was part of creating it, could you say, was a materialist or an atheist? Yeah. Not a single now, one. Now, what he's saying, though, is positivism. It's a slightly different thing here, okay? Yeah, I was wondering Let's about that. Let's read this exactly over carefully here. Quantum mechanics is philosophically antithetical to the entire idealist sense of epistemology. That is because in order to effectively engage in quantum mechanics, you have to embrace several key principles of logical positivism. For example, the analytic synthetic distinction is a big one, as well as a soft form of verifiability criterion for meaning principles. I might add that Christian idealists are all the more than happy to reject it at almost every opportunity. So once again, quantum mechanics cannot possibly support a single idealist argument because idealists themselves have already decided in advance to reject the core epistemic rules that govern it. Uh, no, this is this this actually really sticks on me, like really pisses me off. Is that Okay, well, when they say positivism here, what they're saying is this is the shut up and calculate interpretation of quantum mechanics. They're basically saying quantum mechanics gives us accurate empirical results, therefore we're not going to bother trying to understand what it actually means. Okay? It, it, it's, it's, so yes, if you adopt positivism and you add quantum mechanics, you can't get idealism out of it because positivism cuts off metaphysics, right? But science is never something that is, you know, based on... You can't base science on positivism. That's Positivism is scientism. So, yes, when you strip away the scientism out of quantum mechanics and, you know, other theories, quantum gravity, for example, such that, you know, the instrumentalism is gone and you just interpret it as literally saying what it means, it will reach idealism. So what they're doing with logical... The, the, what, the way logical positivism or logical, logical positivists can avoid idealism in quantum mechanics is by simply avoiding any metaphysical discussion of it at all. It, it's, it's a, it's a cop-out game. It, it, it's literally saying quantum mechanics is not meant to be taken as a literal theory of reality, but just a useful tool to get empirical predictions, right? Therefore, we're not going to treat it as a literal theory of reality. So... Pretty much everyone knows that that's kind of a, a BS attitude to have about science. I mean, yes, you can do science like that in a sort of sense, but you can't derive any actual meaning or um, you can't derive any knowledge claims from it if you do that. 
And unless you're, you know, trained to be a logical positivist, you're going to see right through that. You know, there's no point in doing science unless science is referring to a actual real thing that has metaphysical existence in reality, you know. Otherwise, yeah. you're just getting, you're, you're getting things that are useful at making predictions, but you're not getting anything that can relate to knowledge claims. And what we want out of science most is something that can give you knowledge claims about reality. So literally what he's saying here, when, I, when I'm saying he's re I'm rejecting logical positivism, me and IP and others are rejecting logical positivism, he got idealism, is that we're, it's code word for saying we're treating quantum mechanics as something that's literally true rather than just a useful tool. So it's quite ironic here because Reality number two is. Hello? Hello? You there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. you fine. Uh, uh, continue. continue. It, it's, say, saying? it's saying the exact opposite thing of um, what it's meaning here. It's that by rejecting logical positivism, we're taking quantum mechanics as literally true. And whereas he's saying this and he's just saying it's a useful tool to get predictions and so on and it's not something that has um validity in its own right like it, it's not basically if lo if you attach logical positivism to something that theory isn't true it's just a useful tool and furthermore i'd like to add that this kind of thinking has had a very poor history in the history of science um way back ernst mach thought that atoms were mathematically useful fictions, right? Right. And they didn't really exist. They just were useful for making sense of patterns in the periodic table and so on. I know so then, people make that claim now about all the mathematics. Yeah. Yeah, well, the thing about it, well, not just mathematics, but this was actually a scientific, you know, a theory, a conjecture that there are atoms, right? Well, now we have the electron microscope and Ernst Mach. I mean, he's a great scientist, but on that point, he's got mud on his face, right? And what's interesting is the reason that he held that view was because of logical positivism. Now, what happens again is that that exact same thing happens all over again um, with uh, quark jets. Quarks were invented, you know, they, they were posited because, to explain particle symmetries. And the next thing you know, uh, people were saying they don't really exist, they're just mathematically useful tools to, you know, explain particle symmetries, okay? Well, they didn't learn the lesson from the atoms, and then, you know, a couple years later, they have these particle accelerator experiments, and they find quark jets. You can't isolate the quarks, but you can see the effects of, you know, you hit a single particle, and suddenly it looks like it, it spurts off in three directions and then collapses back together again, you know? You're talking about the double slit experiment, right? No, 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 this is quark jets. This is uh, particle accelerators where they... Oh, they, this they, is they different. smash okay. protons and antiprotons into each other, and they can then see... The quarks, they're never actually like released because they're in confinement, but they will spray out from each other and then collapse back into each other and actually see the effects of there being real quarks and the particles coming apart. Oh, this is where we discovered when there, there were such things as quarks and we can actually yeah, physically... Yeah, and so and quarks yeah. were not just a mathematically useful fiction to describe particle symmetries. They were a real thing, just like the, this case with the atoms before it. Right. Well, um, and yeah. likewise, you know, pe some people are saying that um, emergent space-time should be treated in this instrumental fashion, right? It's just a way of describing things. I've even seen, uh, unfortunately, William Lane Craig do that. I don't know why. I think it's he doesn't like the, the implications of it being outside space-time. But um, what's interesting here is, you know, Hilbert space, right? That's just a mathematical space. And, well, technically, yes, it is. It's It's a... Just like a wave function is just a mathematical object, it's not an actual thing. But, but the wave function describes something that is very real in reality, which is the probability wave. And likewise, Hilbert space, which is the, the domain of wave functions, maybe Hilbert space itself is not a real thing. That John, uh, I think you're breaking up here. John? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Um, listen, okay. let's try to wrap this up so we go on to number three, okay? All right, yeah. So the point here is, is that, um, you know, if you take Hilbert space as describing something real, and you bring in the whole discovery now that, you know, from quantum mechanics alone, that space emerges from Hilbert space, then we've just falsified physicalism within, you know, 
if you treat Hilbert space, what's described, what's being described by Hilbert space as a real thing, that that thing that's being described there is not a physical realm of reality. It's it's sub physical. Okay, can you sum it up in a short sentence of you know, like uh, to explain number two very easily? Well, number like, two is just simply not treating quantum mechanics as a literal thing. All right. It, so, it, 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 saying logical positivism, they don't embrace logical positivism, and you should adopt that with quantum mechanics, is to say that you should only ever treat quantum mechanics in, instru in an instrumental sense and never as something that describes reality. So, yes, okay. if you stop short of describing reality with quantum mechanics, you're never going to reach idealism because you're not reaching reality. So, of course, he's not going to get to idealism if, if he's not going to try and not even trying to describe how, what reality is with quantum mechanics. Well, There's also something else here that says that idealism themselves has already denied and rejected the core emesthetic rules that govern it. Yeah, so that, that, that's logical positivism. It doesn't govern it at all. The Schrodinger equation is what governs it. There's nothing to okay, do yeah. with logical yeah. positivism. They, they, don't, they, don't want, they, they don't want to take the, the implications of the theory seriously, though, and so they hide behind logical positivism so they don't have to take quantum mechanics seriously. Oh, uh, I see now. All right. Let's uh, move on to number three, okay? All right. All right. Let's start with number three here. Okay. Shall I read it? Oh, oh yes. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Quantum idealists constantly argue from authority in place of actual argument. It's so brazen, too, that you can almost make a drinking, drinking game out of it. Every time inspiring philosophy reaches some critical junction in his presentation, he almost never backs it up himself with any hard data. He just splashes some guy's face on the screen next to a self-supporting assertion, as if we're all supposed to simply take the guy, that guy's word as gospel on an otherwise highly controversial subject. Oh my I wouldn't gosh, have gosh. that much of a problem with this either if he at least just stuck with mainstream scientific authorities like maybe Stephen Hawking or Sean Carroll. However, several of his most key arguments are, supporting almost are supported almost entirely by the object say-so of an completely obscure figure with uh, with no authority at all. For example, no one name that inspiring philosophy loves to drop uh, in his arguments is Henry Stapp. I don't know any nice way to say this, but Henry Stapp is a complete nobody, a spirit science hack whose only claim to fame is that he co-writes books with Deepak Chopra. The guy has exactly zero technical oh. Okay, let's okay, stop for a second here. Let's, let's examine everything. Firstly, yeah. I, I can't speak for everything inspiring philosophy does, but firstly, actually, Inspiring Philosophy has backed up a lot of hard data in his videos. Yeah, I was going to say, he has lots of hard data. Ton, I mean, the quantum mechanics that debunks materials, and if you look in the, the description box of that thing, it's got peer-reviewed articles all through it. You, you know, one time I sent a message to anti Citizen X of one of his pure cool like evidence and gave it to him and showed him the evidence, and all anti Citizen X could say to me was, you know, well, that's not pre-reviewed. Now that's it, basically. And when he get back a bit of evidence, he just—he's basically saying it doesn't work for me. Therefore, I did well, not. That, that, well, that's the other thing I want to point out here. So they ask for peer review. They are always asking for peer review, and so I give them peer review. I'm probably one of the most peer reviewed theists on YouTube in terms of how much I cite peer review. Or not, not you, you know. I, Hello. Uh, you might need to change your mic here, John. Yeah, John, you're breaking up. Better now. Yep, we're better now. Okay, just keep your okay. mic the way it is. Yeah, all right. I would, I would broadly like to comment on, the, on this guy is that he makes a lot of claims, claim after claim after claim, that are unsourced and unsupportable, and that auto automatically should be a, a problem. Um, he says he's studied quantum mechanics, and he says he's taken both the graduate and undergraduate level. Just from the way he writes and the way he thinks and the fact that he does not bother giving any real scientific credentials that I can find, but more to the point, just looking at the way he writes and thinks, he thinks and acts like an engineer, very much so. I may be wrong on that, but I'd like to know. Yeah, that's think very exactly much the like problem. I, I, I use this all a the time in my work. A lot of people in quantum mechanics, a lot of people in, they've been trained to think like engineers rather than scientists, unfortunately, and it's because, you know, they don't like bringing the metaphysical implications of quantum mechanics in. And if you try to, like, force the issue as to what quantum mechanics actually means for reality, they'll get irritated by it. Uh, yeah. One example of this is, um, remember that, that poll that uh, IP cited as to the nature of quantum mechanics with uh, physicists? They uh, had 6% yeah. um, say that 
Well, it was that fifty-five percent said that um, the conscious observer plays a role in the mathematical formalism, aka the Schrodinger equation, and in the, the collapse of that, right? Yeah. But it plays no actual physical role, right? And six percent said it did. Okay. Now, what's funny here is they're sticking with the math. The math. They're saying that the math has consciousness causes collapse. That's the majority of physicists are saying that the math says consciousness causes collapse, but they then go on to say it's in the math, but it's not in physical reality. Meaning the theory that we have, you know, this is, remember I went back to point number, this kind of ties into point two as well, right? Where they're, they're taking the positivism and they're saying, we're going to accept that the math is telling us something, but we're not going to say that it's actually describing reality. We're going to, we're going to drop short, we're going to get empirical results out of it that can, we can, you know, predict, but we're not with, but we're not going to, um, we're not, we're not going to actually go the step further and say that it has, it's describing reality, because if it does that, then that's going to mean that materialism is going to collapse, and it, the, uh, the mind is going to have a fundamental role in the universe, and we can't have that because, well, we're a dogmatic materialist, we don't like that. And so they and hide behind positivism. And I would point out that if you think like an engineer, you're building things, you're designing things. I mean, I have a friend who designs integrated circuits, right, and does a lot of stuff at the QM level. And he'll tell you, you could do, you could do, you know, all sorts of useful, productive work all day without ever thinking about the, you know, the metaphysical uh, uh, assumptions. Exactly. Well, that, that's why. Oh, it is. You just plug the math in and do it, you know. I mean, they you don't, don't want it. To, they don't, huh? they, they, that, that's the thing, is they... They have chosen essentially to think like engineers because they don't. The whole point of science was to seek the truth, right? Yeah. Oh, and my friend. They don't want the truth here because the truth is going to poop all over their, um, you know, their, their yeah. metaphysics. And my, my friend who's, who's, who, who designs the IC chips is pretty much an agnostic, um, although he has some theistic views, but he basically doesn't think about these questions and doesn't find them very interesting. You're going to find numerous it, physicists. It. He's not hostile is what I'm saying. He's just, he'll just admit, I can do this all day without thinking about any of those there things. There are numerous physicists who have that exact attitude. And when you try and push it past that, they get irritated. Um, yeah. John, do you have anything to say? You've been quiet for a while. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah bye. We can hear you. We can hear you. Hear you. Yep. Uh, okay. Um, I, I wanted to say something about Henry Stapp, actually. Um, he called him a nobody, right? Oh, I, I'm, I'm looking at his Wikipedia page because I'm – but um, there, there's some interesting things about that. He was invited by – Who? Who? Um, Who are we talking about? Henry Stapp. Henry Stapp. Henry Stapp. In 1969, Stapp was invited by Werner Heisenberg to work with him at the Max Planck Institute in Munich. He only wrote one one uh, one book with uh, D Deepak Chopra in it. That's not his claim to fame. His his uh, claim to fame is uh, is uh, has something to do with H A S matrix theory. I forget what that is. Um, he he does he is. Uh, he's not a nobody. Clear. If I'm not yeah, mistaken, he's not a nobody. He, he association with Polly as well. See, uh, yeah, so yeah, Wolfgang Polly. Um, in 1958, he was invited to work with him personally on. He was he was he was, he was his like like clinic. yeah he worked with him closely. He was he was like yeah he's not a nobody. Yeah. No, he's not. I mean, he, he, he's, it sure beats out. Sam he's also he's work actually with, worked in Polly and Werner Heisenberg. Those are the two. I mean, they're like like six founding fathers of quantum mechanics, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, there's lots more, but yeah. of the, the, the big six big names that everyone will stick out, Heisenberg and Polly are two of them. Are the two. Big you, don't, you don't get invited to work with them if you're, not, uh, no, if you're nobody. That is that would be true. Yeah. This is this is akin to being you know under Einstein. Yeah. So he's not a nobody. He's he's uh. Um, no. And furthermore, it's funny because IP points out that this is not like a say so. He he's, he's okay. Let's read this. However, several of his most key arguments are supported almost entirely by the abject say so of completely obscure uh, figures with no authority at all. 
it's not an appeal to authority. Here, here's what they're thinking, is that, this, that, that we're presenting arguments, as it were. I mean, yes, in a sense, we are presenting arguments. But in a different sense, we're just explaining, we're, we're, we're not presenting arguments so much as we're teaching. Okay, this is just the physics, right? You take the positivism away, which is an illegitimate um, bastard child, so to speak, and you know it, it's illegitimately stuck in the quantum mechanics in the first place, but we address that number two. If we, if we take that out, this stuff gives you idealism. Yeah, I mean... Uh, it, it, that's just, we're, we're just presenting the science as it is, minus the positivistic prejudice. Right, you know, it's uh, that's very true, I mean... We're not appealed authority just because it's some famous scientist. We're actually saying no. The studies and scientific this evidence is does what say the science is. It's, it's, it's not. It's not even up for argument for crying out loud. This is just the facts, you know. Well, it, it amazes me. Another thing. What's funny is oh. he said, if at least he stuck with mainstream scientific authorities like maybe Stephen Hawking or Sean Carroll. Well, I've appeal, I, I've used Sean Carroll in my videos a lot. And I've used him to say that you know space is not fundamental. Well. Space is the ground of physicality. If space is not fundamental, then that means physicalism is false. Isn't that what Sean Carroll's been saying for a while? Oh, yeah. He's got a whole... He, in fact, what's funny is he's got a, a blog entitled Against Space. Now, I want to briefly mention TMM here because he kind of critiqued me on this where um, you know, I point out that space and emergence and quantum information and then that contrasts with the atoms and the void thing. The more appropriate example of this, okay... It's much cooler. You can look this up. Uh, there's a title, a, a blog by Sean Carroll that is entitled "Against Space." Okay, up in the upper right corner, of the, the um, you know the the blog again. It says, "In truth, only atoms in the void." Well, the void. What's the void? The void is space, right? So he's literally saying, "In truth, only atoms and space," and then he immediately goes into the title of the article, "Against Space." So the against space part is, that's what the theory is saying mathematically, but then we're going to just ignore what the theory is saying and hide behind the screen of positivism to say that's just, it's producing math, it's a mathematically useful fiction, and then we're going to hold to our in truth only atoms in the void materialist philosophy anyway. So, um, <coughs> in response to what Team M was saying there, no, I'm not saying... Carol is a moron because he's rejecting a science. Carol's science is very, very, very good. Okay, is that Sean Carroll isn't seeing the implications of his own physics at the metaphysical level, which me having a master's in philosophy degree have a, I, I do have some authority there. Okay, I mean, right. Sean Carroll is a great guy. His physics is wonderful. I use it all the time, but I just happen to know a little more about the philosophic implications of it than he does. And that's, not, okay. that's not the diss on Sean Carroll. Yes, I said it was hard because I was kind of ticked off at it their time, but... Let's, let's, uh, I'm sorry, let's, let's get back to the page here of... Uh, not to interrupt you, but the page. All right, to, all right go ahead. So we finish up number three, or do you just want to skip oh, to so number where, four? Where are we here? here? Nobody's fear of science hack. Okay, that's just bull crap, which we, we pointed out. That has exactly zero technical publications involving any hard empirical data or rigorous mathematical analysis. Uh, that is um, an ad hominem. Um, any, instead of all of his publications are long-winded rhetorical arguments, the vast majority of them landing in purely philosophic journals and conferences. Well, you're talking about the philosophic implications of quantum mechanics, right? If you're going beyond just the math, then trying to understand what it means, well, of course. Or what it's saying about reality beyond just the predictions, then yes, those predictions mean. Spurring philosophy is literally ignoring the entire entirety of mainstream quantum mechanics, choosing instead to build his entire case on the absurd ramblings of completely fringe crackpots. Uh, no, we're trying to uh, ignore the entirety of positivist scientistic posers who are treating quantum mechanics as an engineering tool rather than actually studying quantum mechanics. Yeah, we're ignoring no positivism on purpose because positivism has no business in quantum mechanics and it uses a smoke screen to hide behind getting you know, hide, hide away from the implications of quantum mechanics. Yeah, just uh, just quantum like, uh, Yeah, anti is next not showing any evidence to disprove what uh, inspired philosophy is saying in the first place. Just saying, yeah. no, he's wrong because I say so. <laughs> these these are simply. I mean, this is this is an appeal to authority here, you know. And that authority, when we examine that authority, that authority is you're going to adopt our positivism, or we're going to call you a crackpot. And, well, uh, and, and why, why are you adopting positivism? Well, because we're materialists. 
and we don't want to uh, accept the implications of it. Okay, so then we have a, a, a circular, you know, they're not going to they're not going to say this, of course, right? When you kind of press it, you can get these admissions out, and it, it's a circular problem, you know. It, it's it's you should repeat, you know, this is a runaround. You you have to appeal to the authorities here on this. Well, the authorities are positivistic. Well, yes, that's because it's materialism, and then therefore idealism is false because. The authorities which are adopting positivism to avoid the ideal implications are saying so. All right, let's move on to number four, okay? All right. What do we got here? The entire idealist argument relies on aspects of quantum mechanics that are known to be unresolved mysteries. For instance, what is the proper physical interpretation of the wave, fun the wave function? What constitutes a me measurement? Do particles obey local realism or not? These are actively debated questions in quantum mechanics with no real consensus beyond the standard Copenhagen inter interpretation. All right, firstly, let's take a look here. What is the proper physical interpretation of a wave function? Well, they've shown that the wave function is real. That's, that's been demonstrated in the proof, and it was um, peer-reviewed, and so on. There is a real probability wave. What constitutes a measurement? Well, we can, you know, that's really an illegitimate debate. I mean, yes, you can say it's not only minds that collapse wave functions. But um, I wish I had Trevor here because he could. I don't want to. I, I can talk most of the time, but I don't I'd like him, someone else to. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll answer this because I have some background. Um, isn't a measurement um, like supposed to be when you observe a particle? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. What constitutes measurement? This is this is another smoke screen. Okay. Yes, we're ignoring the smoke screens because they are used on purpose to try and hide. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna expose the smoke screen. This whole entire video, not entire video, but the, the basic. Thing we're getting at here is to blow away the smoke screens. Yeah. Yes. So what they're what they're going to say is, it's not the conscious observer; it's a measuring device that collapses the wave function, the photodetector, um, a screen, etc. Yes, that's correct. Now, that photodetector or screen or what have you is made of what? Atoms, right? Which are made of yes. subatomic particles, which obey the Schrödinger equation, which have their own wave functions, which have their own composite wave functions. So until someone collapses the wave function of the photodetector or the measuring apparatus, that entire system of the photodetector and the particle itself are not collapsed. And you can keep on going this way. You know, you can say, well, something outside, another measuring apparatus does this. Well, until that is observed, then that's also in superposition, right? And so on and so forth until you point out that it, it's relational to a particular... Uh, reference frame, and then you ask, well, relative to the conscious observer's reference frame, what finally collapses the wave function? Well, logically, the, the whole chain of collapses, the von Neumann chain, terminates back on consciousness, right? So this is not to say that only consciousness collapses the wave function, that's a, a straw man, but it, what it is to say is there is this, this chain that will necessarily, if you, if you treat quantum mechanics as literal, there's a chain that will go back to the, the mind. And they're, they're treating this as a unresolved mystery. Why? Because they don't want to resolve the mystery. And if you, I mean, if you watch Stapp's lecture on this, he points this out. It's just, it's literally taking the the Copenhagen interpretation. He's like, here's the thing. Let's check this one sentence out. These are all actively debated questions in quantum mechanics. With no real consensus beyond the standard Copenhagen interpretation. Well, consciousness causes collapse is the standard Copenhagen interpretation. Simply extended past its positivism. You take it as literally true, and, and, and you know, staff pointed this out. I have a whole lecture on him pointing this out, where the collapse of the wave function. If you, if you treat this if Copenhagen as literally true, then this the notion of consciousness causing collapse is a logical um, consequence of it. This is what it is, right? Here we go. Do particles obey local realism or not? Well, that whole thing was falsified. That's the whole point of entanglement and the bell inequalities. And so that's not a, that's not a debate. That's been settled a long time. Not only is that settled, but they've actually ruled out all the loopholes now too. So that that's a done deal. Um, he also uh, goes on to saying that it's a classic God the gaps, whatever he's trying to start uh, here. No, okay. Here's the thing. Okay, and and okay, I, I will give him a little bit of credit here. That part of the problem with it. Okay, 
Its classic God-begats reasoning wherein some current hole in our scientific understanding of the universe inevitably serves as a breeding ground for supernatural explanations. Okay, what does he mean by supernatural here? It means probably beyond science, right? Probably, yeah. Okay, now, he's wrong, but he's not... This is one area where I'm going to give him a little bit of credit, because the reason he's wrong is because this whole notion was kind of... It, it, it was a fault of... The, this is kind of the theist sin, right? They, they've, they've made the situation where they want to push God outside the natural on purpose and, you know, make a dichotomy between the natural and the supernatural in such a, a strict fashion that, you know, it's either a scientific explanation or it's God being put in the gaps, right? So God of the gaps is basically an argument for we can't understand it with science, therefore magic that cannot be understood with science did it, right? That's not what we're saying. The, the entire point of this quantum idealism thing is to provide a naturalized theism. That's kind of what makes it unique in regards to all the other, you know, apologist waves is that we have a naturalized model of theism. So no, it's not, there is a current hole in our scientific understanding of the universe, therefore God. It's, we fill that hole in, we know what that hole is, what, what's there. It's a completely scientifically explicable model of God or God's actions. There's John nothing more serious about it, nothing, hello? Oh, sorry, um, go ahead, John, sorry. Nothing magical or supernatural. I mean, there is supernatural in a different sense. It's the outside space time, but not in the in the sense of beyond rationality, not beyond. You know, science. Be a, well, it'd be a good idea that you send me some of your uh, science like uh, evidence pages, uh, any like that, so I can put them in the description. Yeah, below I did want. Maybe I, I should make a video on this. I, I was accused by another atheist of this, and I, I point out to him. You know, he was complaining about this other theist he was arguing with about how God. He tried to put God outside of science and so on and like no that's not what we're doing at all my model is at the bottom level the, the fundamental law of the universe is essentially a scientific description of god or description of god in you know, scientific terms and so no John, this is not god of the gaps it's not it's not god or science it's god is the scientific explanation and god is not a magical yeah. explanation either god is right part of the theory in a what way that makes sense and science also what about uh he also goes on saying that there are reasons why scientists are jumping to accept idealism as a new theory of quantum mechanics, chief among which. Yeah, is this this is okay here. Okay, hold on. We'll get to number. We'll finish this, and we're gonna actually we'll tie this to number five. Yeah, the reason they're not doing that. Remember, I pointed out the um the the the, the survey that was done before. Fifty-five percent rejecting the conclusions of their own math. Mm, yeah, yeah. Reasons. That's why the reason they're not jumping on board is precisely because they've been hiding behind the smoke screen of, idea, of positivism, and they've been trained to do so. That's that whole positivism thing. You hear the positivism away, which, you know, most of the average public understands positivism as baloney. It's, 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 it's internally contradictory. So like, basically they just don't like the results. You can't verify the verification principle, you know? I'm sorry, like, do they basically just don't like the results of idealism? Is that it? Oh, yeah, and so they're hiding behind positivism. So the, the, this, this whole thing here is, is, is going to be useless. Okay, number five. Now, it ties in. Now, he's going to try and – let's just read this over. Let's uh, pick apart what he's doing here. Yep, yeah, I can take five. it away. Idealists deliberately avoid making any hard, falsifiable predictions. Instead, all they do is accommodate. They're all, they're all more than happy to take prior existing data and then shove it into their pre-existing paradigm. And never do they make any effort to predict a single hard, piece of hard empirical data that we didn't already know. Okay, first of all, let's, let's take up the first charge here. It's actually not true that we're doing that. I mean, you know, Dario had that model of idealism, you know, from integrated information that was tying into the wave function of the universe. And Hoffman, for example, is working on a model that explains things in quantum mechanics better than quantum mechanics does, in a sense. He actually derived... Um, the Schrodinger equation, or not the Schrodinger, the, the free particle wave function from the interactions of conscious agents. Explain um, the reason for quantum spin, not just that it exists from the interactions of conscious agents. So this is false. However, um, what he's doing here is suggesting that there should only be like he's not he's not leaving any room for even the slightest, most obvious metaphysical implications. So yes, yeah, some metaphysical implications are not going to be things that could necessarily be readily falsified. However, you can take things from quantum mechanics and 
pit them against the most basic, most obvious metaphysical truths, like things that are not like that shouldn't be controversial. The things that should be just be you know accepted as, as properly basic truths. Put those two together, and yes, it's not a perfectly scientific argument, but there's there's literally no reason to reject it. I mean, you can't treat science as though it's in a vacuum for metaphysics. It's not to say that you know metaphysics is doing stuff that's outside science or is you know magical or anything like this. It's just say the two talk to each other, you know. So, for example, we know realism is false, right? We know space is an illusion. That's all physics, right? I can even cite Sean Carroll arguing against space. He has a whole blog against space. Um, and so if the world is an illusion, and you go back to Descartes' first meditation, right, what did he talk, what did he say about the world being an illusion? And remember, what's the one thing that isn't an illusion, even if the world is an illusion? Oh, wait, the mind? Our, our mind. Well, yeah, duh. Right? That's a metaphysical statement. But it's the most obvious one. In order to reject that, you have to reject your own mind, right? My mind is an illusion. I mean, you say, my mind is an illusion. That's just nonsense, right? I, if, if someone says, my mind is an illusion, if, if, you, if you reject that metaphysical claim, you pretty much remove yourself from rational conversation. Okay, you, you are a mindless zombie, and there's no sense in arguing with mindless zombies because everyone knows they're irrational. Because they don't have a mind to have reason, right? All right, so... All we're doing is, you know, there's a, there's a simple thing there. The world is an illusion. The mind isn't, right? Okay, well, maybe, so the matter isn't there. The only thing we have reason to believe exists is, it really exists, is mentality. Now, maybe you can posit something else there to, to fill in the blank, uh, neutral monism, or um, maybe there's some other substance that, that is not material or mental in addition to the mind or something to this effect, but that's, there's no reason, there's no logical reason to do that, right? If you say the world is an illusion, but your mind isn't, the first thing that pops into mind is Berkeley. I mean, it's just obvious. There's, there's, I mean, people will say Berkeley sounds crazy, but the only thing crazy about Berkeley is that, not that he thinks the mind is real, it's that he thinks the world is an illusion. Well, physics has already jumped the truck there anyway, so it's not really a problem. I mean, the world being an illusion is just physics now. It's That's not up for debate, right? We have all the peer-reviewed data we need on that. We can count that in all we want. And so... Okay, I think we should probably just keep moving on. I just realized right. that Max already left us. Okay. Uh, so so all we do is accommodate... Okay, okay. So, yeah, this is baloney. We do give empirical data. And furthermore, this treats... Um, this rejects the most basic... Uh, inclusion of metaphysical facts that, that should make the, the situation obvious. Even when they're actively when they're actually trying to make predictions, they, they still completely fail. For example, I once placed this exact challenge when starting philosophy, and his only response was that if idealism is true, then the universe is a hologram. And he's complaining about post dictions, and uh, well, <laughs> get used to it. I mean, there are physicists, string theorists, that are making saying that gravity is a post diction of string theory, and so I mean, that's that's. Theoretical physicists are already doing that kind of thing, okay? That's kind of silly. Uh, now, that might sound impressive to a layman, but inspiring philosophy doesn't seem to understand that people like like me actually study this stuff for a living. Well, let's just break this down, shall we? For starters, it's pretty safe to assume that inspiring philosophy has no clue what a hologram is in any technical sense. I do. Uh, okay. And I've made more videos on that than he has. Um, there's a lot of mathematical baggage that comes with a claim like that. Yeah, that's fine. We're also interested in the metaphysical claims behind it. It's because we're not looking at the the math in the you know lay level videos that people can't understand. The math doesn't mean that there's you know the, the metaphysical claims are false. And if he certainly hasn't been firmly trained in any of it, yeah, well I have. So bye bye. <laughs> Yeah. I, I'm gonna, you know what I'm gonna do because he, he's he's hiding behind this this smug, um, like sense of authority with his positivism. And well, I have some authority. I have I have some training in this, right? So I'm just gonna come here and crash their party, and I'm gonna enjoy crashing their party. And uh, where they're they're using this to like you know, trying to defend materialism. I'm not gonna have it. So tough. I'm gonna be your. Uh, the troublemaker. Instead, it sounds more like he just picked a, it up from a bunch of spirit science websites and, and thought it sounded cool. Um, 
Have you ever seen... Okay, you talk about IP, but have you ever seen me argue from anything regarding spirit science when I talk about holograms, holographic universe in my videos? Yeah, I've seen one about a holograph one. Who, one do, who do I cite? Who do I cite when I do that? And what do I talk about? Let's see. Was it Mishu Kaku or was it someone else? It was Brian Green and Leonard Susskind. And moreover, I talked about the physics behind it. I talked about the Beckenstein bound. I talked about, um, you know, black hole thermodynamics. Uh, and then how this led to the ADS CFT correspondence. This is not spirit science. This is this is physics. Okay, I'm popularizing physics. Well, once again, anti and X just takes stuff out of his ass. Yeah, unless just... he's saying that Green and Susskind and Kaku are all spirit science people, uh, he doesn't have an argument. Second, his prediction isn't really a prediction at all, since because he didn't make it. Professional cosmologists and string theorists are the ones talking about the potential for a holographic universe. And sparing philosophy is apparently just writing on the coattails. Well, if by running on your coattails you mean popularizing physics, then yeah, he's writing on their coattails, but so what? Again, that's not prediction, but accommodation. Well, it's pretty obvious what the implications of the universe being an illusion are. Mind is an illusion unless you are want to argue that you're a zombie. And, um, well, therefore the mind is more fundamental than the universe. So, that's idealism for you. It's real universe. Okay. Third, nothing about quantum idealism has any logical connection to holography whatsoever. Uh, that isn't true. Not, I mean, it, it's not true directly, but it's, it is true that it is, there is some connection. Uh, namely, holography led to the discovery of the ER-EPR correspondence, which showed that you know wormholes equal entanglement. And from that, it was shown that entanglement is more fundamental than space-time. Well, when you get entanglement, though, you can then tie in uh, the mathematical implications of that. And if you look at Tononi's stuff, he described entanglement as a form of integrated information. It's a whole mathematical description of that, right? Now, what was funny, actually, about this, I want, I want to point this out. I, I commented on this some time back, and he complained that I didn't know what I was talking about. I said, Rod, do you even know what a hologram is? Okay. You just, what you just said for, uh, forms any logical connection between idealism. None of what you just said forms any logical connection between idealism and that word. You're just spewing out techno babble with no coherent rhyme or reason to it. So what's funny here is he says that I'm not making an actual physics argument, right? But when I do make an actual physics argument, and I then tie it to the math, right, which I, I pointed out, holography indirectly leads to the conclusion that space time emerges from entanglement, and then we can use that to argue for idealism in a very rigorous mathematical sense, right? Yeah. And so when I go into a, you know a a technical argument, what is that to him? Techno babble. He just mocks it. He, he hasn't provided a counter argument at all. He simply mocks it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, what you about... Said you still made zero empirical predictions that I can test and verify against some null hypothesis. Well, I just did make... I mean, the entire point was to lead to that prediction. Calculating the phi content of the universe. All right, so this is stupid. Um, Go on to the next one, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, he's hiding behind, uh, you know, arguments from ridicule and ad hom and uh, appeals to authority here. That's pretty much all this is. Okay, just ask yourself... How does the assumption of an immaterial mind essence behind all of reality lead us to a universe where magnitude and phase information encode a three-dimensional geometry onto a two-dimensional surface? Well, I just linked them to you. The encoding of the phase information onto the two-dimensional surface leads to E R equals EPR, leads to space and emergence of entanglement, leads to idealism via quantum integrated information. Okay, where is the mathematic where is the mathematical derivation of this principle? Well, I pointed out Dario had uh, you know the exact what the, the kind of reasoning I did, just explained, he has worked out the exact math on that, okay? So there is your mathematical derivation of the principle, okay? Um, quite literally. It's, it, obviously, there isn't any because inspiring philosophy has no clue what he's talking about. Well, sorry, I just blew you completely out of the water. You're just plain wrong. Um, we already have the derivation mathematically, and, and actually, Dario is actually working on a paper right now to um, publish on this. Uh, fourth, how to measure holographness of the universe. Where do I point my telescope, and what empirical data am I trying to observe? What is the predicted power, a special density of the cosmic microwave background? How much redshift will type 1A supernova produce, and what distance? These are types of questions that have meaning for empirical predictions and not some vague allusions to techno sounding jargon. It's also well, not something you can actually witness with a regular telescope. You'd yeah, well, the thing about this is, is I mean, 
they are producing predictions from a holography, and they're very good predictions. There's uh, the, Verlind has been using holography to describe, um, you know, gravity is an entropic, or not gravity, um, dark matter is an entropic effect. Entropic force, like it, it's, or dark energy actually. Yeah, it got a, a, a calculation done of the exact uh, order of magnitude. And it was, it was, it, this is not, you know, this is, this is very solid stuff. And it, it's, it's just treating as though it's not even a, a sound hypothesis. So but what's hey, the fourth yeah. one say? Uh, hmm? Oh, sorry, go ahead. That is four. That is the fourth. Oh, that was? That we don't I thought we the third. We don't, we, we don't have, we can't measure holography, holographness of the universe and, and just point out that, that they are producing predictions uh. to test this with. Uh. But hey, maybe I'm being too harsh. Maybe there really is something to this whole soul's collapse wave function, cause wave functions to collapse thing. So here's a challenge for all you quantum idealists out there. Why don't, put, why don't you put your money where your mouth is and submit your findings to an actual scientific journal? Not some hack philosophical forum or, spirits, or a spirit science conference, but an actual technical journal reviewed by experts in the field. <laughs> I guess Max Planck isn't good enough for him, huh? Well, I don't get this. This is all based on scientific <laughs> it's so stupid. It's like, Exactly. It, it's retarded. Yeah. I mean, well, I, you I'm can look working this on stuff some of this up. now. I'm working on some of this stuff now to get this stuff published in, in certain journals. It's going to tick people off. I mean, I, 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 I'm tempted just to do this just to, just to like, you know, tell anti-citizen X to shut up on this. Well, well, I don't get it. He's challenging people to look up evidence for this. I mean, yeah, I can not, look it up and give it to him. Moreland has some. I have some connections with Moreland and uh, one of his students, uh, Miratu, on how to publish or you know maybe inside tracks and publishing stuff. So I'm gonna I'm gonna work on this and get some stuff published so we can simply just <laughs> shut him up when he says this. I know that hey, I yeah, personally he... had no trouble publishing findings on my own in some exact same journal. So what's stopping you? Okay, honestly, guys, who's kidding? Who, who here? Quantum mechanics is relatively difficult stuff. And it takes years of training in mathematics and physics just to start the surface. Yes, that's true. However, the intelligent layman can understand the metaphysical implications of it. I mean, you don't need. You need, you know, if you want to make predictions, exact predictions, yes, you need the math. But to understand the the, the principles behind it, you can you can do that from watching Michio Kaku or Brian Green on television. Yeah, it feels like the anti citizen X. Um, anyone who he's hiding behind this, authority, um, yeah, and, and I, I'm saying that as a person who understands both the math and the pure and and the um, league level stuff. Yeah, well, I I have a I have a contention on on what he's saying here. He, he's also saying that you don't have the ability to understand the mathematics and the physics without going to college. Oh yeah, that, that's the thing. It's, it's the oh, appeal brain. to authority. It's the appeal to, authority. and I kind of, I, I totally messed that up on them because I went to college and got the, you know, degree, right? Yeah. So yeah, this, pretty is, much this is that baloney. Is. Yeah, it feels like anyone who first well, reads this is gonna think this guy's smart, but if you actually do look into quantum mechanics, you'll find out what he's saying. He's just pulling it out of his ass. I mean, yeah. well, there, there's there's enough books on quantum mechanics, like written by the you know, six that we talked about earlier, that even a layperson could understand understand it. And then you have the uh, then you have books on the mathematics side, the differential equations and stuff like that, that public can actually have access to. So it's it's it doesn't even seem to me that you really need college to understand it. Maybe you don't to actually work in the field, but to understand it the mm -hmm. The knowledge is available to everybody. Yeah, that's why it's so easy to spot yeah. a bunch of idiot pickers like yourself because you obviously have no formal understanding of the subject. Unfortunately, that's also why it's so easy to just pretend to be an expert anyway because none of your fan base has the slightest credit of education in partial differential equations. Uh, I do. Um, or that course, uh, linear system theory, uh, same or statistical processes, same here. Okay. Yeah, so I, I do have education in that, so that pretty much blows that up. Everything about your quantum idealism argument is therefore only convincing to an audience that doesn't know any better. Thanks for reading. Well, if he means by knowing better, um, appeals to authority, hiding behind positive smoke screens, um, arguments from ridicule, etc., then, then, then sure. 
I, I would challenge him and you know back up what he's trying to say. You know, not yeah, just yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's what we're doing this video for. I mean, <laughs> this thing is stupid. It, it's yes, these are the standard cop out lines he's using from the physics department. You know, this is how they avoid the philosophic implications of this stuff. Right, to anti system X. It doesn't yeah. work. It's a bunch of smoke screens they're using. If anti system X out there, he can go ahead and mix responses if he wants to, or come contact us. We be more than happy yep. to. Yep. Okay, unfortunately, now here, that's why it's so easy to spot a bunch of idiot pickers like yourself. Because you obviously have no formal understanding of the subject. Well, he does have a formal understanding of the subject, but he's using that to be an idiot faker. Right. He's used that before here. Let's see. Let's, let's let's summarize the whole thing here. Okay, number one, he's hiding behind his appeal to authority and um, you know, well, simply false assertions in some way, right? Non sequiturs that, that that quantum mechanics can't support idealism because they they're not doing um, mathematical quantum mechanics. That's just false on on both counts. It's a non sequitur that that's the case. And number two, it. it we are doing that. We're just not doing that, you know, in public videos all. Um, then he hides behind positivism, uh, trying to conflate positivism with quantum mechanics. That's a big red herring, and blowing that out of the water is, uh, you know, when you, when you point that out, what, the, what we're really saying is he doesn't treat quantum mechanics as something that's literally true, just as, as a tool. And and um, that's actually supported within his article at the at the bottom in the notes. Uh -huh. He actually has that quote for, from David Miller, quantum mechanics for scientists and engineers, and it basically says exactly what you're saying. Um, that he's fitting it into the uh, logical into logical positive. Where is that quote? Let me see that. Because it's at the very bottom, under the underneath the thanks for reading, under the notes. It's like the one. It's the one citation he has. Hold on, let me see here. Um, okay, yeah, the philosophical approach of dealing only with the questions that can be answered by measurement, or that are purely logical questions within some formal system of logic, and regarding all other questions is meaningless. Yeah, see, he doesn't treat quantum mechanics as something that's literally true. No. Yeah, it's the most common approach, but it's, it's, it's no, it epistemically erroneous approach, and you don't get knowledge that way. So yes, what he's saying is he does not believe in quantum mechanics. He doesn't believe quantum mechanics is a knowledge claim. claim. So, so, so why yeah, make yeah, this no. up in the first... Why is he arguing... Yeah, yeah. yeah, if you understand quantum mechanics, then you know it's not a knowledge claim. <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow that nonsense off. Yeah, the reason he doesn't want it to be a knowledge claim is because it's a knowledge claim that, that you know destroys his whole worldview. Right. Um... And it's uh, more of a scientific one, and, and you can't just, you know, hide when you can, but you look like an idiot if you do it. You can't hide behind instrumentalism to avoid the conclusions of science. So, uh, no, he's the idiot poser here who's pretending he knows, you know, that he's, he's the one adopting quantum mechanics, when in reality, he's just admitted implicitly that he's not adopting quantum mechanics. Um, he's in a yeah. superposition state of adopting and not adopting it at the same time here. Yeah, that's basically to sum it up right now. And then, quantum mechanics constantly argue from authority. But look who's talking. <laughs> Firstly, we shot that apart, but yeah, he's he's the idiot faker. Uh, yeah. So before we end this, I wanted to do a video, a four-minute video that Anti Citizen X made. I figured that we should have like a short video on this podcast, okay, sort of. Well. Uh, and it's just going to be a shoot, shoot for four minutes. Uh, so Max, where I left, he messaged me back. He told me that he had to leave and go to bed early. Uh, yeah, so he, that's why I left out of the podcast a little early. Anyways, uh, so right, we start with this video right here, right? Uh, so are any of you familiar with uh, free will? Because uh, I've been studying it from Inspiring Philosophy lately. I, I have uh, I haven't seen the video on question. All right, then uh, let's start the video then. And uh, Jean, if you want to ask away, because you've been quiet most of the time, so okay, let's start. I really focus on free will much on my channel. I made like one video on it years ago. All right. Well, here we go. It's only four minutes. It'll be really short.
that seems to slightly be plagiarizing uh, South Park there. Um, what? I'm sorry. Go ahead. I said that that seems to be slightly plagiarizing South Park a little bit. Hmm. Oh, is that what? Oh, I, I, I don't know. I... Terrence and Philip type of thing. All right. Jahan, I think you're breathing heavily into the mic. Like, uh... No, I'm, I'm not even on my mic. I'm not using the computer here. Okay, never mind. Let's continue with this. No. Hmm. Go ahead. Can't hear that at all. You can't hear it. No, there's. It's like <laughs> there's no sound. But you can't. It's not. Well, I think it's coming from Jahan. Like Jahan, is there some kind of noise is coming from you? I keep clicking it, so it keeps coming I'm to my screen. I'm not saying a word. Okay. I can't hear anything, and I'm not hearing anything. Can Can you mute your mic for a second? Okay. Sure. It stopped right when you mute your mic, John. It must be coming from you. Go ahead and turn on again. Okay, well, I'll just start the video back here for a second here. It's way too quiet. Huh? It's way too quiet. Can't hear Wait, too quick. Can you hear a thing? It's hang on. Okay, here, try this. Barely. Uh, it must be your mic or something. I have it on full blast right now. Okay, here, let's go get do this again. I want to stop this right here. You guys can talk if you want to. You can unmute your mics now. Yeah. Now, do you have anything to say before I do? Uh, yes, I have a, a few things. There. Um, the whole, the whole thing about the the measurement of free will. Free will is a concept of of we're able to make our choices. You know, it it, it that's the whole concept of it is making choices. It's like more like a thought process than something that can be measured. It, it, it's uh... Jahan. This guy gives me a headache. I I know I know how you feel, Jahan. You have anything to say, Jahan? You can un your, unmute your mic now. What is he saying there? Wait, wait. You didn't hear the video? Yeah, it was way too quiet. Oh, I'm I don't understand it. Uh, 
So basically he's saying that you can say that the mind is immaterial, but then that's basically meaningless. You just basically have no proof of understand what it is. I could just say he was <laughs> No, 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 idiot. Yeah. Good grief, this guy is retarded. Firstly, we know matter doesn't exist. That's been falsified. Okay, we know from quantum mechanics that space is an illusion. If you don't agree with that, then you're just plain wrong, okay? Now, so no, we do know that the mind is immaterial because there isn't any such thing as matter in the first place, and that's not to say that we don't know what it is. It means immaterial things are the only thing we know that exists because it's the only thing that does exist. Yeah. Well, I mean, the whole basic idea of free will is that we have an age, age of causation that allows us to choose, you know, different outcomes. We choose ourselves. And a lot of people always say to me, you know, what causes the agent? Well, agent's determined by itself, its own choice, you know. Atheists always like to do that false dichotomy, is it determined or random? But no, the scientific evidence shows that our subjective experience is changing brain chemistry. I mean, you can look this stuff up from Jeffrey Schwartz and other different, and even neurology. Matter of fact, um, you should also know that there's no evidence that the brain chemistry is causing subjective experience. Nothing in neurology says that the brain creates the mind. It, there's nothing at that at all. It's, it's a physical it's assumption. See, there, it, it, see what happens is they assume that the mind has to be material, right? Yeah. So therefore, they say they originally said the mind correlates to certain parts of the brain. Yeah, they're they're assuming materialism basically. They and it, it, and it doesn't work. Here, let's continue on the video. Yeah. Well, well, I, hold I, on. I was gonna I was gonna comment there a little further. They then found yeah. out that you know you can have different brain states corresponding to different mind states. Or the same, you know, the same brain state, same mind states corresponding to different brain states. Like, you know, the Martian feels pain, he has D fibers firing, whereas the human feels pain, he has C fibers firing. Right. Um. Yeah. So they then shifted over from identity theory, which says that mind states are, are particular, you know, brain components, to minds are processes. Well, the whole framework for that assumption was that the mind has to be something physical in the first place, which is completely groundless. Now, they're probably doing that because you're directing dualism, but they didn't take into account the fact that, uh, well, the brain doesn't really exist either, at least as a material thing, right? Right. Yeah. Now, I, I have a question. Um, with with quantum, quantum computing and um, and some of, the, uh, some of the people within mechanics is kind of postulating, you know, that the brain may work more like a quantum computer than how we originally thought. And is there any validity to that? Well, they did actually have a, a recent article that was published that was actually taken a bit more, um, this was like more mainstream. They were tying quantum biology. They noticed that when you had uh, rats and you gave them a um, two times of lithium, right? One of the lithium was uh, it, it, two different isotopes, and yeah, therefore one was like a heavier element. Chemically, the two are exactly the same, right? They, they bond the same, they do everything else the same, but they have um, different wave function frequency because of they, the only difference is quantum mechanical. And they found that these two differences created behavioral differences in the, in the rat, actually affected the rat's consciousness somehow. And so they were, from that, they were theorizing that there may be something similar in humans as a ubiquitous thing to consciousness, and so it has to do with entangled particles, atoms in the brain. Okay. This is a, you know, it's hard to, it would be hard to pin that down. I mean, we probably have a couple more, you know, a decade or so of quantum biology. We probably will know more about that. But um, I mean, it, it's obvious. You can't, the mind isn't a process. I mean, it, it, the notion of the mind being a process is not even a coherent concept, right? Mind's a proper noun, not an activity. And right. You know, if other arguments like Searle's Chinese room, it's, it's right. which are a priori, which therefore trump any um, you know empirical arguments you have. <coughs> you know, it, not that empirical arguments are bad; it's just that they have to fit into a, a context. They can't trump a priori. Oh yeah, I read that. So, I read the Chinese box experiment actually. Yeah. It's supposed to show that our mind is, it's not based on like, on uh, semantics, like, uh, to, uh, so now semantics, they're 
basically like ones and zeros like a computer, right? The Chinese boxes are supposed to show we're not based like that, correct? Uh-huh. All right. No, I read about that. It's very well thought out, actually. But even today, I see atheists argue to say that's not true. And they've tried to. It's just so dumb. But anyways, let's continue on. Yeah, it, it's, it's, they just, they, they'll just assume their physicalism, and then they'll make these lopsided arguments to try and get out of this. And They're literally not taking the primary evidence of consciousness as primary. They're taking correlates, which is a post hoc argument, primary. So literally all they're okay. doing is shoehorning and saying they're shoehorning Trump's a priori arguments, and therefore the a priori arguments are false, which is it's, it's, it's garbage, and it has to be thrown out because it's using a positivistic epistemology again. All right, well, let's continue, okay? All right, here we go. Uh, I have a different one. Yeah, a different, a different, different definition. Uh, starting a causal chain. Yeah. Mind, mind to the, or, or free will is the ability to start a causal chain. That's the agent causation, and that well, that well, follows on idealism as well as the um, the Conway Hope and free will theorem. Well, uh, th there's some problems with with his argument that the computer now has free will because a computer is it only does things because of pre-programmed responses it, it, it everything that a computer does is pre-programmed response it doesn't actually do things on its own yeah uh, it, it so it, it it's, yeah yeah I don't understand how you it's think not, it's not the car it's not the start of a causal chain no. that's, a, that's the best way to I think a better definition would be the start of causal chain well, well, first of all, it's like the Chinese box thing, you know. Um, it, would, it would incorporate the without coercion thing because there's something to start, you know, causing it. I mean, our minds, we can think about that. We are able to think about different things. The computer is a bunch of one and zeros. It doesn't know, you know, what words we type into it or what color, what image on screen. It just knows ones and zeros. It's That's, that's a terrible argument for what Antises and X is making. Uh, anyways, let's continue on. Go on. But you should look up Cracking the Nutshell. She had a video on um, the Conway Coke and Free Will Theorem and how it ties into you know the delayed choice quantum eraser. Because there's an actual that's just plain false, right? There well, there is yeah. an empirical difference between the two, and there is a a way of you know studying this from an empirical perspective with the, the quantum eraser experiment. Yeah. But moreover, I don't like his positivistic epistemology. I mean, it's like he assumes that just because something can't at least at the moment be studied in terms of empiricism means that it's it is false. So firstly, we have there are ways to tackle this from an empirical perspective. You know I forget the, the video let me try and find the video she had on this. Uh, it's on uploads. Um all right, here we go. Here here. Do electrons yeah. have free will, the Conway Coke and free will theorem. Closing the free will loophole. Uh I'll probably put that in when I upload this. I'll probably put that in the description. All right, then. Thanks. You can send to me as a message. Yeah. So th this is this is a a um. Hold on here. Yeah. So this is yeah. There, there. This is actually being studied. This is you know from an empirical perspective. But just to assume that it has to have that, it, it, it's stupid. Like it's 
I mean, yes, in that particular case, it might be the case because you know you can't tell the difference in the two, and these are choices being made in the in the actual physically observable world. Then, then of course there should be some difference, and there is, and it's the whole coin eraser thing demonstrates that. But um, it's his 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 whole positivistic approach. He completely dismisses any a priori analysis of anything, and any you know the basic metaphysical. And not all of metaphysics is you know BS. I mean, some of it's just obvious, like you, your own consciousness, right? Yeah. I think, therefore, I am is a is a metaphysical truth that is or should be um, pretty standard. Well, yeah, but you, you know, it, it, he's just assuming you know physicalism or or materialism i should say actually it's just thinking that the neurons in our brains the same thing as computer works that way no it doesn't as a matter of fact you know I idealism is supposed to show that uh there's quantum information nothing nothing's exactly it's uh the electron through the double slit experiment that's the basic, like uh evidence for that correct the idea that it's not physically there at least not physically but the quantum information is But, uh, no, the delayed choice quantum eraser has to do, and, and the associated Conway Copen free will theorem has to do with does the, the particle's past cause you to measure it in a certain way in the future, or do you cause the particle's history to change? When you look at the, you, you change now the. Oh, okay. Yeah. I see. Um, you you can go on that on that if you want to. Uh, so the well, the whole idea with this, um, I don't know why, but when I looked at it, this saw this video, it just really bothered bothered me. Really, I I, I just don't understand this. I you know back then I wasn't too sure about free will talk. I, I tried. I gotta go. By the way, guys. Oh well, hang it. Let's just we, wrap this up talked, then. Yeah, we, we talked about the. Um, no, actually, model. actually, actually, I've been drawn to one. So uh, let me wrap yeah, this up. Really. Oh, okay, hang on. So I'll wrap this up really quick. Um, anyways, so far, anti says next show no evidence whatsoever. We and his logic's completely dumbfounded. If he wants to join us on podcast or wants to have a discussion, that's fine. Or make a response, that's fine too. But in the end, you know. Everything he said, he just basically is pulling out of his ass. All right. Anyways, uh -huh. thank, thank you, Jean. Thank you, Johanan. And for Max, he uh, for he left early. He already messaged me. He had to went uh, go to bed. Anyways, thank you all for coming Bye. along, and see you next time. Bye.